first things I remember about my childhood was the house in which I was born and spent the first 17 years of my life. And within that house, the one room that I remember vividly was uh, the kitchen. It was the kitchen. It was the largest room in the house and it was the warmest room in the house. And it's where the most activity went on in the house where we met to have our meals. It was both the kitchen and the dining room and the old stove and the water pail and all those things. And it's there where my mother was preoccupied much of her time. And where as just a child I spent uh, most of the time uh, around her and what you all the work she was doing and the baking and the churning and the washing of clothes and all the activities went on throughout the week there. But the one thing, uh, in addition to all that, it's pretty common to all homes, was the uh, chart she had on the wall, pretty good sized chart, and it showed the outline of a hill. And uh, on the hill you showed on the, you started out on the on the left side of it, uh, going up the hill, would be uh, just a, a, a small child moving up the hill in the childhood, and then it would show him coming into a, a, a adolescence and adulthood, going on up the hill and growing stronger, and and going on up until he got the top, toward the top, and then you'd show gradually going down the other side as a person became older and uh, bent over and going down the, the, the other side of life. And as she just went, as we talked about that, of course I raised with questions and she would tell about <coughs> her own life and uh, on that chart where she was when her father uh, was killed in, a, in an accident of, in, uh, working on a barn, raising a barn, her mother and the sickness and uh, not only the sad times, but the good times she had as a child growing up and there. And then she would contrast where she was now at her age of life when she was about the peak of going down the other side of the hill and I was just coming up the hill. And for her, uh, it made quite an impression. I mean, it stayed with me all these years. That, uh, the uh, uh, ups and downs of the stages of life. <clears throat> Outside, of course, the uh, the farm, there's many things going on. Got a little older, and the dooryard, of course, and the big maple trees, and all that uh, around there. And then, of course, on out into the uh, barn where the animals were, and the horses, and the sheep, and the cows, and getting them in. And there's a lot to always to do. And the fuel, main fuel, of course, was wood. And when you're old enough, you had a job of uh, seeing the wood box was always f full at night dry wood that uh, the older people in the family had cut, but the child's job, my job was to see that wood box was always filled at night. So you know in the morning that uh, your mother would have good fuel, start the fire to get the breakfast, and she really depended on you for, to do that. So it made you feel like you were really part of something kind of important. So uh, that uh, of course, they grew older and took on larger, uh, larger jobs on the farm. Of course, being when you could handle the animals on yourself, or a horse, and harness a horse, and ride a horse, and work with horses. I remember plowing the first time I ever plowed with a walking plow. I was 12 years old, and uh, they put me in a field with a gentle team of horses, and uh, plowed uh, practically all the day. And I remember that night, my father, the first compliment, one of the few he ever paid to anyone, was uh, they said he told my mother that today, the day he became a man, he says he plowed as much as a man in that field. And uh, I was very short; lines were around my neck, and I had to stand behind the the. Uh, handles on the on the plow otherwise you hit a stone it would the plow would go back and forth and knock you over so I remember that experience and I suppose there are many more but what else you got there what about uh, sounds like a lot of work what were there other uh, toys or, or books that you remember books uh, very few books the only book I do remember there was a Bible in that house and it was used most as a doorstop I think anything else and I remember as I got old enough to try to get in there, and my older brother tried to read it, and we didn't get very far into the first book, whatever, Genesis, I guess it was, and trying to 
uh, very confusing of all these who begot who and who begot somebody else, and it was discouraging reading. Was, and I would advise anyone that it, not to start there. Start somewhere else in the Bible that made it a little more sense. It's something you could relate to. Do you have any toys? Toys. Very few uh, toys. You had sled, of course, a little sled. You slide down the little hills around there in winter time, and you made all kinds of things out of snow, and uh, you made uh, tracks, uh, fox and geese tracks around uh, go around. And I remember one day uh, I had a neighbor who was three or four years older than I was and much bigger, and I had spent quite a lot of time on a nice new snowfall making this uh, uh, fox and geese track around the circle and then in like pie into the center and you try to run around and keep in these paths and not uh, get out of the paths and if the if the uh, fox was chasing the geese and then you 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 couldn't if you had to get out of there while you that was part of the game he came down I remember and messed that whole thing up I was mad at him for a week he uh, messed the whole business up other uh, toys uh, yeah, really, uh, very few. I remember a carom board we had, and that's just a, it's an old board, uh, sort of, I hope poor people could work around it. And you had carom, you shot carom shots to try to get uh, these things into the pockets, like on a pool table. But then it also had a checkerboard on it, you played checkers on there. And... Uh, that was, uh, we didn't have many things like that. Toy, we, <clears throat> as I got a little older, I remember my brother, older brother, was working in stores, working in grocery stores or meat stores. And I don't know whether that tricked my interest or not to have something. I remember my mother let me used to take all the things out of her cupboard and set up my own little store in some part of the room. And then she'd come and buy things off from me. And anybody else I could get to, to buy something. <laughs> But there wasn't any real exchange of money. You just kind of put your hand over like you were putting money. There wasn't any much any money to, to exchange. And then I suppose uh, skipping rope and uh, things like that, climbing trees. And you, you were the youngest of four children. I was the youngest of four. Yeah. yeah. Did you play a lot with your brothers and sisters. Or no, no, they was quite different in age. See, my next brother, he was well, well, my sister. I played with my sister. She was three years older. And we played together a lot and got along very well together. Oh yeah, that reminds me. Uh, you got a little older. We had a uh, <coughs> wheels were a great thing. You always had some old wheels on the farm, and you learned to roll them like a hoop, you know, and roll around. Then we had a little. Uh, I think my older brother probably helped construct this, like a sulky wagon, made up a little sulky wagon, a homemade deal. And I remember. Uh, I'd, I'd like to sit there and get somebody to pull it, you know. Not a real horse, a human. You know? My sister, she usually got that job of uh, trying to pull me around the yard. and We had a lot of fun with that. And uh, rolling wheels, see how far you could roll them down a hill. And, uh, and that was about, uh, I don't know, it just seemed like there were so many activities, you know, depending on the weather and things to do outdoors at the... Uh, uh, what was work kind of became play, you know, loading up the the, the uh, sled, the big uh, bob sled with uh, wood on it, and and uh, see if you could get it up to the house without losing the, the load. And things like that seemed to be. And there weren't other kids around, or two no, kids no, didn't know about other children. Or? No, I only see uh, school. I didn't go to school. I was five, and I remember I went to school in Ithaca actually first year. And that was because my father was a, 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 a cattle buyer, and as well as a farmer, part-time farmer, and uh, he bought for an outfit in Ithaca. So in the uh, wintertime, uh, we went in there the first time when I was four years old, 1923. I was born in 1919. And I do have memories, uh, not very pleasant, uh, of a few things happened uh, that year, it must have been. Uh, as I think about it. And one of the things was there was a flash flood down uh, about a mile from our place where there's a mill and a big mill dam set up. And the mill had burst and uh, in this uh, flash flood and swept out a bridge that was there and it swept the uh, operator of the mill off from his porch, which was kind of close to the stream, obviously on down the stream and there he was uh, the bridge had wrapped around him and he was he was injured and and uh, 
and uh, and uh, strapped in this uh, around this tree. My father came in the yard and uh, got went to the barn and got a piece of uh, a long piece of rope that was used in hauling hay up into the hay mouth in the barn. He cut that down, brought that down, threw it in, and for some reason I had climbed into the little old Ford car or pickup or whatever it was. And off he goes and down there and he stops at the top of the hill uh, where the action was down lower and left me there with this little old lady who spoke no English and she was from the old country and uh, actually was from Bohemia and she she tried to uh, <clears throat> look after me while he raced down the hill and the men tied these ropes together and uh, went on across the uh, where the water and rescued this man from this uh, this tree. He was injured enough, so he never went back into running the, the mill again. In fact, the dam had gone out, and that was the end of the source of power for that mill. They lady put they later put steam a steam engine in there and did some work with that. The reason I know something about that probably is not all, but from memory is what my brother older brother told me uh, because he had worked there uh, at this at this mill. The other thing uh, that uh, left uh, quite an impression on me all my life is uh, the Ku Klux Klan was the uh, action or active around that period in this part of the country. And they had uh, done two things at, uh, at about the same time, maybe within the same week. They had tacked on the trees uh, some posters which were anti-Catholic and anti-everything, anti-black and everything else. And was really inviting, you know, to uh, get lost, uh, to get out of here. And I remember my father coming out and ripping those down and cussing to himself about this dirty trick. And uh, then we were awakened in the night, and the near neighbor, whose name was McCarthy, and of course there was a lot of Irish Catholics around this part of the country, and small farms, and they burned a cross in the field. It was on his farm, but it was about halfway between our house and his house. And I remember we were aroused in the night to see this burning cross uh, out there. And the next day, the next morning, when the daylight, we went down and looked at it and went on down to see how he had fared out in this, and he was scared to death. He had he'd blocked the door all up and so on, and he told about looking out the window and the reflection of the fire on the window, and it scared him terribly much. Well, that fall, we went into Ithaca and lived, and I don't know if there's any connection between those events. I really knew. We never discussed it. It never was discussed, really. It just happened, and uh, there was a little counteraction to it. The, uh, the Irish uh, people around there and the Catholics uh, knew where these uh, clans people met, and they knew, uh, and they went. And this is a story, of course, told me. I, I didn't go with them on this, but it's been told so many times, I, I, don't, I, I must believe it that they went to the hardware store and got the longest tax they could uh, find in the store, bought all of them up, and they went up there, and while these people were having, they knew they were having a meeting, they scattered these tacks all around the parking lot where they were, and you can imagine what happened, and those were thin, thinner tires than they are today, and not much tread on them, and when they came out, most of them had flat tires. And that also occurred in another place, uh, up toward Ithaca where uh, this fellow that ran the, the meat business, uh, he was a uh, Catholic too, and uh, he sent his men out to circle a place up there where they had their meetings and do the same kind of thing. Were they actually more, were there many blacks around? Were they actually more? No black, Catholic, it was Catholic right there, yeah. Yeah, it was, the feeling was rather strong, it was kind of subdued, nobody liked to talk about it. These events I've just reported to you would think they would have been worthy enough of a newspaper article. I've looked over the old newspapers back that period, and there isn't one mention. Now, the, the Auburn papers had something, and I've been called by the Auburn papers to remember what took place if I hadn't. But uh, nothing appeared in the local paper because they didn't, uh, well, it was just, uh, they were running the community, and they uh, just didn't want to say anything, I guess. I don't know. Was there any, ever any trouble with the... the the Catholic Church that's there now was there then, right? Was that oh, the yes. Church yeah. that you went to oh, as a child? Yeah. So I went to as a child, yes. And uh, my mother told when she went to that same church as a child, and she was born just half a mile from where uh, I was born, and she would tell of how when going to church she'd be all dressed up. Her mother, who actually was a Quaker, and uh, but her father was Catholic, and 
she'd dress her up to go to church on Sunday. She'd walk a couple miles, and of course there's dirt roads and all that stuff there. And she always said how this one fellow, this uh, didn't care much for Catholic. I guess he'd always, he said, uh, she'd have to watch very carefully because he would try to get as close to her as he could to drive her into the ditch. So she'd have to go in the ditch with her nice little white clothes on. And she, uh, of course, always resented that. Yeah, I went to the church, uh, the Catholic Church in King Ferry, and uh, became an altar boy and uh, for a few years, and, and uh, got taken up to Rochester to see the bishop and people up there, and uh, never, uh, well, you know, you, you thought about becoming a priest uh, because it was one of the vocations open besides farming, which was uh, uh, rugged work, but I, I liked farming. It was always so much going on in the farm. You never felt uh, bored, you know, always something going on, when, uh, year round, whatever the season. There was something to do, had to be done. It gave you a feeling of kind of, you know, importance that uh, you were part of something that was um, had to be done. So was this a, when you moved to Ithaca? Was yeah. it a farm that you owned, and then yeah, we owned, and then we went there in the winter time, kept the you know closed up the farmhouse, and uh, and whatever animals we had, we sold. You know, it was in the meat business, so you could sell the animals for meat, <laughs> beef, I guess. And uh, then he would work at the slaughterhouse, and then work in there's a big public market on. Uh, Aurora Street in Ithaca, this fellow had, it was the public market. I mean, everybody came there on weekend. They'd be lined up in lines of block long to get in there and get their meat. They're quite different from the stores of today. And uh, so we'd work there and we moved in on Fall Street. We moved to a house still stands there, the first place we moved. And I know it was in the fall of that year, 23. And uh, my uh, I've been four years old and my brother would have been 14. He was 10 years older. And the introduction there was right around Christmas uh, that uh, they were having a snowball fight out on Fall Street there in, in Ithaca. And there were two teams, one up the hill and one down the hill, right, right in front of our house. And uh, they were making up their snowballs, as kids were doing, and I wasn't involved in this, I just from the window. And uh, throwing them back at one another, and suddenly he got hit and went down. And there was quite a stir, and they brought him in the house, and he had been, uh, they played a little rough. They had a piece of uh, chestnut coal big in, in the snowball, and that hit him in the eye and hurt every man. And uh, I remember him laying under the Christmas tree there with this bad eye, and the doctor came. The doctor made the house calls then, even in the city, and he came and gave my mother advice about how to look after him and so on. And, and that's why I started. Well, I said I started. I started school in the with my sister. She started in the Fall Creek School there in Ithaca. And I trailed along uh, for something to do. And uh, the teacher was very good and gave me things to do and drawings to make and little things like that, you know. And uh, then the next year we came back out in the summer. We'd come back out and do the summer work on the farm, cut the hay and whatever had to be done. And then we'd go back in, uh, we went back in the, that winter, and uh, I made my first communion in Ithaca, and there's a picture around here somewhere of that first time I was over all really dressed up. And we had some friends in, up the street in Ithaca that didn't have any children, and they kind of helped me uh, look after me with uh, getting clothes, bought me a whole new suit of clothes and everything. And... Uh, Immaculate Conception Church in Ithaca. I went there, went to parochial school that year. Esther and uh, it, they were very strict nuns. And uh, was that expensive to go to parochial? No, school? I don't remember anything about the expense. Maybe, maybe these friends of our family paid for. It. I don't know. I just don't know how it was. I don't know nothing about how the finances were handled. What were you aware of the? Uh, Cornell, uh, presence in Ithaca? Well, uh, that's, uh, that's interesting you raise that. Uh, the streetcar in Ithaca came right down near our house, Tauga Street, ran into Fall Street there, ran on down to the, well, where the high school is in there now. And uh, my uh, older brother again had uh, one Sunday, I think it was on a Sunday, he wasn't uh, 
working or what he was doing. I don't think he was going really going to school any place at the time. We got on the streetcar, five cents, I remember on the streetcar. Went all the way up Tioga Street to State Street there. And as you notice on the mall, on the commons there now at State Street in front of the thing there, they they've got they've laid back in the two sets of tracks where the train where the streetcar used to come up State Street and the one from Tioga Street and they'd make there and you could get it you could change and you could get on the state streetcar and go down toward the railroad station if you're going that way to the east or you go west or go up the hill to the east. And I remember going up the hill to the east on that streetcar and going across the the, the, the gate there, Eddie Gate into uh, Cornell uh, University, going across the university. What a trip that was. And uh, going on around uh, and across the other uh, uh, gorge there, the other bridge, the Falk Street Bridge, and coming back down uh, Cascadilla, I guess it was, I just, uh, Sturt Avenue, that's what it was, coming down Sturt Avenue. Man, what a ride, what a trip that was. Yeah, right from that same place. Did, the, did you ever think of college, going to school there at that point? Or is it just uh, no, 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 I never thought about going there. I never thought about... Uh, uh, well, we came back out here uh, after the, uh, uh, we was back in there three or four times. In 1929, I went to the fifth grade, still lived on uh, uh, Clinton Street. We lived two different places on Clinton Street. And that place I showed you this morning was where I went to the fifth grade, 1929. That's, that was on uh, Clinton Street. That's up where St. John, it's called St. John. It was called St. John. It's named after the first mayor of, of Ithaca. Uh, the building is still there. It's, it's used for apartments or something now. It's uh, almost up to uh, Cuga Street uh, there. I went there. I had a very lovely teacher there. I'll never forget her. She, uh, uh, let's see, I must, have, I must have been 10 years, about 10 years old, fifth grade. And uh, I came to school late. I never was... Uh, in fact, I never remember, I have no memory. I remember the first grade. I have no memory to speak of the second, third, or fourth grades. And uh, I must have been in back and forth between King Ferry. And it was strange. I have no memory of, uh, of those grades. But the fifth grade, I have a vivid memory of this teacher. And her name was Velda Ackley, I remember. She came from Avon, New York. And I walked in late. I mean, the, the school had been well started. I came in with my farm clothes on, and I looked quite different from the other children in the class. I, and she, uh, the principal had taken me up, and she took me back and gave me a seat. And I sat there, and we had whatever lessons. And I could see she had sort of, you know, half a grin on her face, and uh, kids were kind of teetering a little bit, you know, of who's this character there, and so on. And I suppose I acted a little bit embarrassed, and so on. And at noon, when noontime came, she called me up, when we broke for lunch, and I usually went home for lunch, and uh, we had a little visit, and she welcomed me, and so on. And she said, uh, "Tomorrow, I'd uh, like you to go I, and get my uh, lunch up at the diner, if just up the street a little ways. So I do that, do that, and then uh, a few other things." And we became very close friends. She uh, kind of took me under her wing, and when I needed it, and I appreciated it. In fact, matter after we moved back out here, she wrote to me. And I wrote to her, and she wanted to know how I was doing and how things were going. And uh, then I came back here and finished up 7th and 8th grade at the old King Ferry School down on King Ferry, which was on the northeast corner, and then went over to the new central school where the Ithaca Gun Company is now, and graduated there from high school in 1936. And uh, stayed out another year, worked. I had, I'd worked around and... Uh, the farming was all going to pieces during the depression. That's certain, that's one memory you carry back from that period is the, the depression. You knew when the, you knew there was a depression because you weren't the only ones that everybody was caught in that depression. And uh, little activity around the handle of the King Ferry. Roy Tuttle had a, a big garage there, and he had a store, and uh, he had about everything that was going on. So I worked for him, and I drove a, a milk truck. I was 16 or so. And helped out on that. And uh, in fact, my senior year in high school, I did that work there. And then 37, I remember got talking to people around there. There was an older man who uh, he'd lost a son and uh, just was a small child, maybe about my age, a little younger. And uh, he and I uh, got along good, and we sat down, I remember we sat down, we used to pump gas there on Sundays and Saturdays and all times, and 
listed and he raised a question with me, what is I going to do now? I thought of high school. Is I going to sit around here and, and uh, pump gas and grease cars and wash cars and that sort of thing the rest of my life? And I said, well, I hadn't thought about it. I thought I was going to go farming. I like to farm. We had a farm, but he could see and I could see too. And we all could see that uh, small farm, particularly small farms, didn't have much of a future in, uh, for as far as the income was concerned. So a principal of the school who is 95 years old now, and I had a Christmas card from this year, and uh, <clears throat> he uh, encouraged me to go to Cornell. I said, you know, he knew and I knew I was not ready for Cornell because I didn't have any, uh, I didn't have a Regents diploma. You know, I just had a high school uh, diploma. And uh, he had me take another course in 37 while I was working part-time, and he said, uh, I've got an application I want you to apply. They had a two-year school at Cornell and like uh, Cobleskill and Morrisville and those schools. He said, apply for the two-year school. It's a practical school and maybe farming will get better and you come back and you can go on farming. And uh, well, We had gone into the very aspect of farming, chickens and everything else, but gee, it just was miserable. So, uh, uh, I guess I filled it out, or I don't know who filled it out, but they sent it to Carl, but I didn't sign it. I forgot to sign it. I didn't do it intentionally, <laughs> but I remember it came back and I signed it. So I went up there in 37 and uh, got a room down on Lord Green Street with some friends of my brother, Jim, who worked in Ithaca and stores. And I got my uh, board for $5 a week and she gave me my breakfast. and. Uh, then I'd go up to corner. I didn't have enough money really to uh, streetcars then, uh, buses, I guess were in then. Uh, I'd walk up that hill and uh, for a few weeks until I got a job in the diner on State Street, still there, different operators, different kind of a diner with the same place, washing dishes at night, and I get my dinner there. And then I got a little extra money, and uh, I could catch the bus up and, and walk back down the hill. Then my brother, he got me a job and a weekend job in the grocery store. A time when you had to package everything, you had to package potatoes and you had to measure up the sugar and tie it up. And I had a character of a boss there. He was uh, oh, he, everything was his. My store, my this, my that. You know, a very selfish kind of guy. Everything you weighed up, he had to watch it very carefully. See, you didn't get it over a over one ounce over the limit and he, even the string he wanted you to weigh the string in the bag and the whole thing and so on. he was a, a tough guy and uh, then I, I got a better job but uh, back at a filling station over in Ithaca there and worked there and uh, I did that for two and a half years. Well, I'm going ahead of the story now. You're, I don't know. Could you, could you earn enough money to pay for college? Or is that well, the college was very cheap. All you had to really buy was your books. The tuition was minimal. And, uh, yeah, I got $15 a week in the gas station. So I felt I was, you know, I was doing pretty good. Uh, that was the same salary I got working for Tuttle when I was a senior in high school. Everything was $15 a week, as far as I know. And uh, that carried... Uh, Carried that. Went two years and a half. I uh, I had to go two years and a half because I uh, I didn't have the background in the sciences and uh, chemistry and physics, so I had to drop chemistry the first uh, semester. Uh, I remember uh, going into the uh, what well, you had the lecture and then you had the lab and then you had the rest recitation period. And the guy who was a snippy little bird in recitation, of course. They had sort of special for the ag kids, and I guess they knew they didn't they weren't too well prepared. <clears throat> and he'd uh, we're sitting in there the first day, and he looked us all over, and he said, "Take a look to your right." He says, "And take a look right to your left." He says, five weeks will be a prelim, and one of you won't be here." He says, "Based on his experience here." Well, that didn't encourage me much, and I went to the. Uh, I wasn't really doing. Well, in his class, the lab was pretty good, and I enjoyed the, the lecture uh, guy. But uh, I went to my advisor, and I said, look, this is, uh, I am, I'm not ready for this. He said, drop it right now. So I dropped it. So having dropped that and dropped, in, uh, I think, another course, physics, uh, I had to stay on an extra term. So I went, it took me two and a half years to get through a two-year program. So I thought I had enough of school by that time, of college, and I had a 
another job I got with a co-op, uh, GLF, and they sent me down to New Jersey in the 1939, must have been 1939, and uh, worked down there. But this is way beyond my childhood. I mean, this is getting you up. Uh, what are we going to talk about? Uh, well, who, who are the most you've talked about? Some people have inspired you. Were there any, any other people that? Uh, well, I meant your early opinions or your. Early well, my mother, of course, was very, very strong. And the teachers, another teacher that I wrote, her name is Dorothy Snow. She's very old and blind. I could show you some of her writing today. Uh, in school, I liked. Uh, I liked. Uh, English, English literature, and uh, uh, those courses. I liked uh, the social courses, social studies, civics. We taught civics in those days, and those kind of uh, courses. And uh, she had a, a good influence. Uh, I mean, my interest in uh, in English and literature and that sort of thing. And uh, acting, public speaking, uh, took part in those uh, things, done fairly well at that. And music, I loved, I loved music. And uh, played the drums in the band. And uh, the reason I had my own drums, I didn't have any, you know, school didn't have much money for equipment, so you had to dig up your own instruments. My older brother had a set of drums, and he'd gone off to Ithaca, and maybe he got another set there, I don't know, he played. And I played in a little dance band and played in the school band and uh, had but, music lessons in school. Oh yeah, of course, yeah, and uh, and band. But, uh, drums. Nobody seemed to know much about playing drums, but I just kind of picked it up and, and I enjoyed it. And we went to be had a little dance band, went around different places for uh, local dances and that sort of thing. And uh, plays, enjoyed school plays, operetta. We had a teacher who music teacher that rotated among the schools and she had every year something going on. Do you remember, do you remember any of the plays or any of the names? Of the... Oh goodness. Uh, I, uh, there was a lot of musical stuff. A lot of singing operettas. She liked her operettas and uh, reenactments of things and uh, uh, I can't offhand remember uh, I can remember some of the songs but uh, uh, I really, I know I really can't. I'd have to look in the yearbook. Of uh, I've got a yearbook that year when you graduated. They always put down all the things you're in. That would have been nineteen thirty-six. <clears throat> thirty-six. Yeah. And I hung around here a year, then went up there to Cornell, and then I went down to New Jersey, Newton, New Jersey. It's where I landed in the middle of the winter, February, with a truck that held a thousand gallons of fuel. Was that just on assignment from GLF? They said, we need you in Newton, New Jersey? Yeah, jobs are very difficult to come by, and this uh, is a true story. It sounds a little exaggerated, but uh, I went to uh, the headquarters there in Ithaca. I heard there was uh, opening up, the, they were just opening up the territory of New Jersey. Uh, GLF had operated in just New York State up at that point. And of course, the uh, Cornell people were instrumental in getting uh, GLF underway as farmers cooperative and place we were this morning, Ike Mitchell's, that was the first uh, agent buyer, they call them co-op uh, in, in GLF in, in, in New York State. And they opened this petroleum division up for the first time. It had farm feeds and uh, stuff like that, farm supplies, but uh, petroleum, uh, fuel oil, and gas, and uh, these things. So, uh, yeah, I signed to Newton, New Jersey. That was North Jersey. You had the counties and uh, North Jersey, Sussex County. This was in Sussex County, and uh, they put you out on the on the truck. And the manager there had been a fellow that had some experience in the oil business, but there was business of, was poor. I mean, there just there wasn't any. Uh, there were a new outfit in there, and the other people were doing a pretty good job of taking care of people. So he he had this assignment that every day. You had he gave you routes to go out, and you had to go out every day on these roads, and you had to bring back. I think it was 15, you'd made 15 stops that day. You had to know where they were, what name of the people, and so on. And week after week, you'd repeat that, and you'd go out, and you'd stop, and if you couldn't visit these people a little bit, let them know you're there. And it seemed awfully uh, dull, and like you weren't going to, and getting stuck in the snow, and having to get pulled out by farmers and everything, you know, kind of discouraging. But uh, he said, uh, 
you uh, you keep to that right, that route. He says, we're losing money, but he says, you stay right there. He says, you this will turn around. And he was right. It uh, What happened was the uh, one of the other businesses let down or something happened, their comp on competitors, and all of a sudden, well, it was on a weekend, and the phone was ringing off the wall. Everybody needed fuel oil, they needed something. And the business really perked up. But I went through that February that year down there, and uh, I was... Where'd you live down there? Lived in a rooming house with a uh, woman there, a widow. She had an elderly widow, and she took in, there were three of us, I think, stayed in her house. Five dollars a week again. And five dollars uh, for the di uh, tech, for the diner for your meals, and uh, that gave you uh, breakfast, uh, a good breakfast, and uh, uh, dinner at night, and uh, you just kind of got something around on, during the mid midday meal, and uh, weekends you hope you got invited out somewhere or something. You five dollars a week there, so I'll give you five dollars to you know blow and. Uh, so I stayed there until uh, I had in that diner. I met a fellow who used to eat there. Big, he was in some kind of a job in Newton. He always read the New York Times, and uh, he was always bringing me up what's going on around. And uh, war was, you see, uh, I haven't mentioned that. I mentioned depression, but we was aware, you know, there's going to be a war back in the year '36 and up through '39 when Hitler. Baited Austria, I think it was, and uh, you know, and you go to the movies and you'd see the, uh, you'd see the newsreel showing uh, this guy, you know, and God, you know, it just looked like we were going to get dragged into it. So this was uh, 39, 40, this is 40, I guess it was, you know, this is where the war started, for Pearl Harbor, and uh, this fellow said he was going over to New York and uh, that could take examination for flying cadets that they were looking for uh, training of pilots. So uh, I thought that maybe it was a good idea, and I wrote, applied and went over. We didn't go over together, we went over at a different time, but I went over and took the exam there, mainly a physical exam, I think, and took the eyes and all that stuff, and uh, passed the exam, and uh, was uh, waiting. Uh, and this was, uh, must have been around November, and I uh, was waiting for uh, Simon. Before Simon came, I had a ruptured appendix driving that truck around. Went in the hospital, and there was quite a seeds there. And, uh, this uh, is in New Jersey? New Jersey, Newton, New Jersey, yeah. You know, the good old surgeon there, and uh, he took care of me. And then I remember the telephone service couldn't have been too good between New Jersey and New York then because of telegrams. Once I remember I sent a telegram up telling my folks that I was feeling like I got a telegram, you know, back. And uh, then I went this uh, I went to this uh, grant this woman where I stayed. Uh, well, you know uh, that was kind of close. Uh, I, I, this happened to me out on the road. I had this ruptured appendix. I was some distance from uh, Newton. And I knew I was in very severe pain. And there was I saw Dr. Shingle up in this small community out there. And I went there and he looked me over and he said, uh, I, you know, this is, uh, I think you, you've got something pretty bad. And he, he says, you get back. And he, well, he said, you want me to call somebody to drive the truck back? I said, oh, no, I can, you know, make it. But every move of the truck, is just dead, you know. And I went back. So you better see your doctor. I went back and went into the waiting room. It was around noon. And I sat there in great pain. And I guess other people were being to see it. And uh, the doctor came out and took a look at me. And he said, you go home. So he had a lot of patients in there that day. He said, you go home. Go to your room. And he over I told him where I was right, As soon as I get through with my patients, I'll be over to see it. So I went over and uh, went to the, and then I went to the bathroom a few times. And all of a sudden, I felt better. I mean, I felt, but I was what kind of went to sleep, you know, and the thing had ruptured. And then he came over and he saw what was going on. So he, they did get an ambulance and they got me to the hospital. And uh, he had to put a drain tube in there for a long time because the peritonitis sets in when you have ruptured appendix, you know. So I got through that, and uh, then I, of course, couldn't go. I had six months and have to wait before I could go into her service. 
in the 19, must be 1940. So I came home in the, I came home as soon as I could get around in Ithaca. And my, that's where 329 West Seneca, that's where my mother and father were living at the time. And uh, I went there and then I got a job waiting table. It seemed like kind of light work in a nice little restaurant of friends of ours out on Elmira Road there. And uh, in the six months, I, or June or July, I went into the Air Force, into uh, Pine Bluff. Arkansas is where I was hired for flying. And I think I told you the story there of I got washed out flying, very much to my surprise. I was really talking, you know, I don't know whether got any question about disappointment. That was a real big disappointment because I had put in, you know, I think 20 some hours and then soloed, and uh, my instructor uh, had four to start with, and then two had already been eliminated. And he told the two of us left uh, on a Saturday. It was. He said, uh, "You boys are going to do all right." He said, "You know, you just don't, don't mess up. So when you start even fancy business, you'll be all right. You'll get through." You had, to, you had to put in, I think, maybe thirty hours. Hour. Monday morning, went about on the flight line, and there, not was not, not my instructor, but a guy uh, in military uniform. There were civilian instructors at this field, although we were dressed in. It's interesting, you know, this is the, we were uh, the, the boys in gray, uh, <laughs> because we were in Arkansas, and they had gray uniforms for, I suppose, a carryover from the Civil War era, uh, because we were training in the South, and uh, he said, uh, he took me for a check ride, they call it, and what I found out later, well, I, well, I'll finish that story, I went up for a check ride and did the maneuvers he asked, and I think I told you this story before, but, uh, he had these assimilated landings. You'd go up around and he'd pull the throttle on you and everything. So he knew you had to get your nose down and get this thing down on the ground. And uh, we did a few of those and uh, other maneuvers that we, we he put you through. And this one time, it was the last maneuver, last thing down and and uh, started up again before you ever hit the ground. He put the throttle back on and you're going up. And then he pulled the throttle back again quick, you know, when you're just uh, a few hundred feet off the ground. Well, uh, you know, you look at your, your I knew the rule, you know, Tim, you no, no turns under 500 feet in those airplanes, those, you know, even no turns. Well, ahead of me was the woods. And, uh, you know, I just, there was no real communication between he and I, he's in the back here and I'm up here. And, uh, you knew by his what he did, was doing, what he wanted you to do. So I got nose down, and uh, then uh, I looked around. Got this nice clear field, nice clear day right over here, and I uh, and he got that. Where are you going to land? I said I'm, I'm going over there. So I pulled around like I was going to make a assembly land there. We pulled it back up and got around, got down, and he told me in a minute he got out of the planes. So I'm. Uh, I'm going to recommend you for elimination. And I said, why? He said, well, because. He said, that last maneuver, he said, it's really dangerous, you know. Said, well, I said, maybe. Would you want to go in the woods with me if you're in that woods over there? And we had a little sassy argument there. And uh, he said, well, you can appeal if you want to. And I knew he went to, I said, I'll appeal. So I went to the appeal board. And uh, they, of course, backed him. And the story was that the first class, this is the second class, he's just one of those breaks in life that you never know. Uh, we were only the second class in their first class. They'd gone through that program, and they'd sent him on to basic training down someplace in Texas. I forgot the name of the field. And uh, they were very unhappy with the group. They sent him down, that they weren't ready for basic training. So that's the reason these guys came up to him. They were going to catch him up there before they got him down there. So they eliminated uh, practically all the rest of us up there. There were just a few left that stayed at the field. And this was before there was a war, right? This was before there was a war. This was before uh, 41. This was 1940. So uh, those of us got washed out, at least there were several, oh, quite a guy I know. I rode out there with another guy, and I don't know, I got a ride, went to Memphis, Tennessee. Why to go to Memphis? Because they got the word, somebody got the word that the uh, Canadian Air Force had headquarters set up around these airfields in the United States. 
uh, looking for washed out, looking for us, looking for washed out pilots. That uh, they were in dire straits for uh, pilots, and you know, they were England was being bombed then, and so uh, they we went Memphis. You could get uh, it was fairly automatic. You just go up and say, uh, well, "I want to still fly," and they take you right over to Canada and go to it. So I went and went as far as going there, and we come back. I remember, and we talked it all over, and some of them went, and some of us, there's four of us didn't. I know that. That uh, everybody had their own reasons, I guess, but uh, I don't know. My reasoning was, you know, if uh, this is getting to be serious here, if I'm going to if I'm going to go to war, or I'm going to go for my own country. I do this, and it's a little feeling against English even then. There was a the, the people were uh, a lot of people uh, had trouble of uh, of uh, going to war, or fighting on the side of England uh, because of I suppose back to the, uh, the Revolutionary War period, the story you'd heard there, and the English, and I, I was brought up from the little things I'd heard about the English, that they were uh, a haughty people and they were, uh, well, in the Irish situation and so on. And uh, So I said, well, look, I, uh, I've got some relatives in California I hadn't seen in quite a while. My, my aunt was out there, she'd gone there as a young person, and uh, my mother's sister, who she loved dearly, she was older than my mother. and. Um, so somebody was just reading the paper, we're talking, and he says, look, here's a, a chance to go to California. There's a, somebody looking for drivers of cars to California, fairly new cars, not over one year old, because there's a shortage of cars in uh, California. So we went down to this place in Memphis, Tennessee, and there's a nice 39 Ford four-door car, looked great, a V8, I don't remember. They pay the expenses for driving this thing. Well, here's that's our ticket. So the four of us got in this car and uh, eventually got to uh, Los Angeles with this car you know, and uh, turned it in and uh, we burnt the motor out on the way uh, going up to Las Vegas and uh, had to wait a week to <laughs> get a new motor put in. We didn't, we, well, you know, it just burned out and uh, crossing the desert at uh, their nighttime and uh, well, it was too hot, I guess. Just burned out. We tried to take care of the old car, but she went. Anyhow, when I got there, I think this is getting to be a long story, isn't it? We, uh, we got plenty of tea. We went to uh, this is my relatives in Alhambra. You talk about remembering addresses. 819 South Atlantic Boulevard, Alhambra, California. And there's where I visited my uncle Will, who had made. He was a widow. Or he was a uh, widower, and uh, he'd married my mother's sister, and Rose, and she died young, and she, but she had two children, and uh, uh, I met the fellow I called last winter here, uh, uh, Las, uh, I can't remember his name, Las Os like he lives in Las Osos, California, uh, we got him on the internet. I can't think of his name. Yeah, I can't either. Is uh, there uh, enough? Or? Uh, I, I'll, I, it'll come to me. But I got to know him there, and he was about my age, and uh, uh, spent some time there. And uh, But eventually uh, came back in the late fall, winter. With, uh, I could have gone to work uh, there, but I don't know. I knew my mother was struggling to get through and things, and I thought I ought to come home. So I came home, and then... Uh, uh, That December, see, where, uh, Pearl Harbor was April December 7th, 7, December 7, 1941. Well, I may be off a year there and there because uh, December 41, it must have been 41 I was out there. Because I came back and it wasn't too long, December 7th, 41. I think I'm off a year there. It must have been 41. I said, well, I could check it out, but it doesn't make any difference. Wasn't, it was April of 42 that I uh, went back into service. You were before. called back and drafted? No. I guess thought I should be there. And uh, my friends all around, you know, were good. I was in, you know, I was in good shape. My brothers both were 4F or something was wrong with them. And uh, 
I, I know, I, I had this feeling of duty, I guess, you call it. That, um, I thought that's what one should do. And I didn't have really any alternative that was very uh, appealing. Uh, and chance to see, I suppose, adventure, you know, see some of the world. So I back in, and then, my God, uh, didn't think I could ever get out of administration kind of work or organization work. I, they sent me down to Miami Beach, and uh, I thought, uh, well, I got their feeling going down there through the blackout on the train all the way down. and went through the Midwest to get to Miami, Florida, days on this old railroad car from World War One. I, I think it was a troop train. And woolen clothes all on that we picked up at Fort Niagara when we went up there to get you know, inducted. And uh, geez, it was hotter than blazes down there in April of 1941. Got off the train with all this stuff on, and uh, people around kind of gawking at left and all this winter clothes. Well, they immediately sent us to a place where we had got khakis and so on, put us on buses. Uh, you know, you had the feeling, I don't know, what the hell's going on here, you know. Uh, we haven't had any training or anything. Uh, and you heard talks about submarines coming into uh, offshore Miami and so on. And I thought, hell, I mean, we're going right into battle. Or, you know, you had the feeling the Germans were coming, invading. Everybody was uptight. The whole place was blacked out at night. Everything was blacked out. Got on this bus, drove over, and uh, rode to Miami, wherever we got off at the Miami Air, uh, train station. Drove across Biscayne Bay over to uh, Miami Beach and went up the main drag there, the name I forget at the moment, and uh, pulled up in front of this uh, grand hotel. Uh, name doesn't quite pop in mind right now. And uh, I'm going to get out. And so we got out. We walked in, and there's a picture in the, in the paper. Man, as we walked out, the Civilians that were in the hotel were coming out, and we were walking and taking over this beautiful hotel right on the, right on the beach, and uh, there we were. And I got assigned to uh, what it, what it was. It was a uh, classification center, so everybody came through. They gave them a battery of tests, and because I had a couple years of college, I guess something they thought I knew something about something, and. Uh, I got assigned this classification unit, and uh, we'd give these uh, these tests, the uh, basic uh, uh, test, intelligence test, and then a series of aptitude tests, one kind or another. Go in the theater, they had to use the theaters, and you had a piece of cardboard, and you gave people these different tests. And then after they took the test, they state what their preference were for kind of further training schools and so on. And then they'd come in, we'd be interviewed, we'd interview them. I became an interviewer, interviewed these people, and uh, helped them get to some kind of training. Well, that went on and on and on, you know, and it was all during the summer, and it was, I didn't like it down there, it was hot and uh, all this, and I asked to get out of there. And uh, so I, uh, I uh, tried back for the Air Force. And uh, I must have put down, again, you had to make three choices. And uh, I didn't care whether it was the Air Force uh, flying or what, but some job in the Air Force. And it ended up, to my great surprise, as an anti-aircraft school in North Carolina. Well, I felt, it, I, well, I probably actually settled second choice, but I didn't think, I, I thought I was going to get my first choice, you know. Well, I didn't get it. And I was very unhappy there. And... Uh, I uh, oh yeah, I asked to be uh, I asked to, I asked to be relieved. I went and explained it to the uh, the guys there and so on. These were big men, just a kid, you know, a little load those eighty millimeter eighty millimeter guns, um, shells, and these things. Boom, 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 boom. Any aircraft, any aircraft. <clears throat> so I asked to be relieved, and they relieved me, and sent me to Nashville, Tennessee, for a reclassification. That was the reclassification center there. So I went out there and uh, piddled around there for months, and uh, didn't do much of anything. 
Was it a big country western recording? No, no. Didn't hear anything about that. Didn't hear anything about that. And uh, finally, oh yeah, here it comes. Uh, a new, uh, opening up a new airfield down in uh, Arkansas. Back in Arkansas. Pine Bluff, Arkansas. And I was assigned there and uh, went there for a short time. And then they opened another airfield up in Malden, Missouri. So then I went to Mall, Missouri, headquarters company, and I was in the same kind of thing I've been doing in Miami Beach and all over is look in the personnel section, looking over uh, people that uh, were there and trying to get people into the right, you know, round pegs and round holes and that sort of thing. You have to do this on. People wanted to get transferred, this thing and that, and other thing. You know, it was there at Malden, though, that the first time it was the blacks and the soldiers and the whites were separated, of course. And but where uh, I don't think Truman had been, the law had been made yet, but apparently they were experimenting and trying to. Some people were unhappy that there were a number of black people on that field so that had qualifications higher than they always used to sign the motor pool, pool to drive trucks and grease car and. And they brought in uh, one into this outfit. I was at the headquarters company. Nice young fellow. And, uh, but there were some people in there and higher uh, up than I was. That uh, I was probably a staff sergeant or something at the time. That did, you were very biased and very prejudiced against black people. Really. And uh, they, geez, they tried to make life miserable. They did. They succeeded in making life miserable for this guy. That uh, you have to go to the restrooms, for example, there was no black restroom. Geez, he'd have to go out and go way back to the motor pool to relieve himself, you know. And <clears throat> he was certainly well qualified from his schooling and training and everything he had, you know. But he came one day, I got kind of friendly with him, you know, I felt sorry for him, as others did. And he said, I, I want to go back. He said, I just don't, this is no place for me. So I just, so he relieved him. There and then uh, they were putting together training crews there at uh, Malden, Missouri, and uh, part of my job was to, uh, as well as others involved in this, was uh, uh, screening the uh, crews, the uh, pilot, the co-pilot, the navigator, the bombardier, the gunners, and everything, and made up this flight crew to see that they were fairly compatible with another. I guess there'd been some problems where, for some reason or other, they didn't like each other and they didn't make a team, you know. So we do that, and then they have to fly to Fort Wayne, Indiana, and uh, with these fellows, they were going over. They were going overseas and take their records and papers and make sure that everything was right up there. And he did that sort of thing. And I went to South Dakota for to Brookings, South Dakota, for some further training in this kind of personnel work, you know, and headquarters work and all this business. And I got, you know, I got to be a it's a real office kind of a job. And one day, uh, I came along on that field, and uh, whatever the year was, 43, 44, and uh, uh, tapped me on the shoulder. I was in the PX line getting a cup of coffee or something, and uh, said they wanted to see me at headquarters. And I went over to headquarters, and uh, this guy wanted to interview me about going into counterintelligence work. And I, said, I didn't know what counterintelligence was. So he kind of explained to me that you know, they'd like to have me try it, and I'd have to go to school, and in Maryland, Camp Ritchie, Maryland. So I went to Fort Ritchie, uh, Camp Ritchie. Couldn't tell anybody where he's going, couldn't tell my folks, nobody where he's going. Fact is, they gave you a couple little assignments to do while you're still there on the field. They give you a couple things to look into, you know, and they're kind of testing you out, I suppose, or something, you know. I remember one guy they wanted me to. Uh, Oh, uh, you get these you get these messages from them. They were read and burn messages. You'd read it, and what you're supposed to do, then you throw the message in the fire and burn it up. You know, I had a few of those, and uh, I was, this fellow was uh, the rumor that he was he was uh, reading Mein Kampf, uh, Hitler's uh, book. You know, where and uh, they wanted me to sur surveil him. You know, a lot of that Connor tells work was. Looking out after people in your own country before you went overseas or anywhere, you know, to see if they were disinfectors or so on. You know. And I saw this guy, and I knew him quite well, anyhow. And sure, he was reading Mein Kampf, and uh, I had never run. I started reading it, you know, and my 
recommendation bag. Leave the, you know, leave the guy alone. He's learned something about the enemy. Don't, don't, uh, don't give him a hard time for reading this book. And, and uh, did he have a German last name? Was he persecuted? No, I don't remember that he did. Uh, I don't think that he just had the book. He was very open about it. It was right there. I mean, you know, there was no secret about reading it. He didn't try to read it under the covers or anything, you know. <laughs> But I went on to uh, Maryland, and another funny thing happened there. This guy sat across me on the train from wherever, or change trains go to Camp Ritchie. I forgot where we got off the train, where they, where they met us at uh, know, Pennsylvania or someplace. And uh, he looked like, and we were both going to the same school, but he didn't dare tell me where he was going. He was going down. I didn't tell him where I was going. He was supposed to be very quiet. And uh, about all this, you know, hush, hush. Well, I went there for training and quite an arduous training and quite a long time of training and I don't want to go into the details of it, but it uh, was all training for Europe. So we're going to go to Europe or learn all you could about the German uh, uh, ways of fighting wars and the marking of planes and all the kinds of things. So you had Actually, we had people that had been fighting in Germany and they had people dressed in German uniforms. I mean, you were supposed to get really psyched up, you know. That, this is the enemy. And I went through that and rather uh, arduous uh, training, uh, outdoor training and putting you in all kinds of situations to see how you handle them and so on. So then we got to leave uh, over Christmas in whatever that year was, 1944 probably, about now. Came home, went back with the idea we'd be leaving for there were a couple up, I won't back up now, but there was a couple other times, one particularly when I was ready to go overseas or go to some overseas from Malden and uh, Missouri. And I got down there into, I was supposed to, the port of debarkation or somewhere, and uh, they lost my records. And I was there for a long time, a month, and they couldn't find my records. And uh, finally I had to write back to. Uh, to Malden, Missouri, and asked the captain there, uh, oh, get me out of this mess. I mean, they, I have, I'm a man without a country. And, and he did. And uh, they finally they finally found the record and went back there. for. But this was the kind of thing going on. Anyhow, when we got, when we got ready to leave, we went to Seattle, and they put us on, and where are we going? We're going to Honolulu. We're going to Hawaii. We went to Hawaii. And we go over there, and uh, went to Schofield Barracks. And what are we doing now? Well, you're going to Japan, you're going to Okinawa. And we have to spend February, March, and April of uh, retraining for Japanese. And their thing we'd gone through in months down in, for the European theater. And so we worked at this. <coughs> And Roosevelt was died on some mid-April. I don't remember the exact date, but I remember where I was when that came around. That was a sh blow. That here we we're losing Franklin D. Roosevelt, who had, who we had looked to through the Depression years and the War years as our our great man. As he was, and. Uh, Day after that, I think we were aboard ship going to ok uh, Okinawa, and the battle had started in Okinawa the first day of April, 1945. Well, this was 10, 15 days later, whenever this was, when we started, and it shouldn't have been too big a trip uh, up there, a uh, matter of days, but it turned into many days. I don't exactly know how long, but what held us up? The Things weren't going that well in Okinawa. I mean, they were putting up, of course, a, a hell of a defense. And uh, if you ever read about it, the Navy played a big role there in softening that place up. And uh, uh, Halsey and his battleships were up there trying to, you know, uh, get it softened up for the Marines and others to go in. And uh, we were out at sea, and we were there, we were fueled up ship was fueled by plane, and there were three of us in this uh, convoy or whatever it was going up there. We put into an island once for a short time, Johnson Island, I remember, just a barren place out there someplace. 
and got, so we get off the ship and stretch our legs and so on. And then we started in, and I guess they kind of thought things were quieting down now, and we could get in, and whoa, the ship on our right was hit by a kamikaze plane, and you could see it, and then she was going. So they swung the ships around, we went back out, and the word you, they knew these ships, could, these kamikazes could go 70 miles, about 70 mile range south of Okinawa. So you had to stay out of their range for a while. Messed around out there, and then few days we tried again, and we went in, and we uh, got into these uh, landing boats over the side, got these landing boats, faster boats, and pulled us in there, and we went in, and uh, I remember getting off from that landing graft, and it was it was a bad day, and the kamikaze planes were still coming, and there was a lot of action, and uh, I was so thankful for somebody that dug a foxhole ahead of me, been in there ahead of me, but it was half filled with water, and I jumped into that, and got my weapons and everything all ready, but everybody had to take cover. They had a horn, a big horn, take cover, take cover, take cover, and then they said. Trucks are coming, and they pulled down trucks. It was mud, you know, and the big army trucks. They pulled down, and you had to grab this truck and get on this truck while it moved. And they couldn't stop the trucks. They would drop the truck, they would get stuck. You got to keep moving, move, move, move. And if you can't get on the truck, walk or get out of the, get out of this place. So we were, we got out, tried to run, get this truck. And the fellow had me. I'll never forget it. And that's why I don't remember why I don't never wore my ring finger for my wedding finger. This guy reached up to get on the truck. He threw his bag over, and he, he, he it's like these bolts you're putting in up there on their bigger bolts, stuck out the threads, and the, he caught, I could see it just as plain, he ring finger caught on that damn bolt, and it pulled his finger right out, just like that. Well, I had to help him out, and I went and tried to wrap something around there to keep mud and dirt out of it. And we got some other guys, they saw what was going on, and we threw him on, got him on the truck, and we got on the truck, one dragging the other, and got up. We got out of there and uh, got to a, an area where we, uh, it was nightfall was coming, and we had to set up a, a periphery where we had guards on all night and to keep, protect the uh, center where people were trying to sleep. And, get, and you had to change every hour, you change a new shift out there. To, and there was gunfire all through the night, but. Uh, I don't remember anybody getting killed in that experience. Next day, we had to go out to around and widen the area out and flush out caves. There, there, there were people in these caves, and there were, you didn't know who was uh, Okinawans and Japanese and soldiers and civilians and so on. And they flushed out these caves by throwing in uh, 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 tear gas bombs. And, and you throw a few of those and just stand beside the cave and just throw them back in like that. And, People said, well, you know, then you had to sort them out. <clears throat> and there were a lot of old people in there. And God, you had mixed feelings about this, you know, this whole thing. And this old fellow I remember was there, and he was frail, and probably about what I am, my age now. And uh, he had no teeth and uh, hungry. So I thought, gee, the thing to do is, you know, get this guy something to eat. So you reach in your rations, your K rations, they call them, or they were. And there was one soft little cheese, a little pack of cheese, a little bacon in it. I thought that was the best dish they had in the thing. So I offered this to the old boy, and he grabbed it, you know, he put it in his mouth, though, and he wanted to chew it down a little bit, and he spit the whole damn thing out almost in my face. I thought, well, what a, what a character you are, that, uh, disrespectful of <laughs> my good food. <laughs> well, I learned later they had never tasted milk products in uh, Okinawans there. And he said, somebody told me later, just like if he offered you a piece of snake meat, they'd, uh, You'd probably spit that out too, you know, been just so distasteful. Culturally, you weren't conditioned to that sort of thing. So, and talk about snakes. That was uh, one of the things they, in the training, you, you reminded that you had uh, not only the Japanese weather and the, the Okinawan weather, but the, and the Japanese soldiers, but uh, you had to be on the watch out for snakes. And they had two other, I forget the names of them, huge. We saw a picture of these huge snakes. Well, we finally got into a little place there next to a uh, PW camp. And this is a, a story that uh, we're supposed to go up the northern isle, part of the island, and there was a camp up there, 
And uh, we were got a jeep, and four of us were going up uh, to uh, that camp to uh, do the interrogation. And there was two interpreters like myself and two interrogators, uh, Japanese-speaking uh, people who could help us with the interrogation. And we were going up through, it's, you know, it's a miserable uh, way up through there. And it was about noon, and we came upon this uh, camp. American, uh, our American post. In a, was a, there was a PW camp there, and uh, we thought, well, hell, let's stop here and uh, re and uh, get something to eat, mainly because we had we could see them all out there in line. So we got our mess kits, went up to get something to eat, and we stood in line there. And while we we're waiting, the um, somebody came out from headquarters and got attention, attention, attention. Any. Uh, any, anybody in this line that can type, we are we're getting, uh, we're interrogating these prisoners of war. We got quite a lot of information. We got to get it to headquarters uh, here, and uh, we certainly need help in getting their notes typed up so we can transfer them. And there's two of us in this crowd of four that could type, and we looked at each other and said, "What you know? What do we do?" You know, nobody else was raising their hand around there. They just, that's it. So we, these two guys, they said, I'm glad they said it. They said, why don't you two guys, they knew we, why don't you stay here and help them out? We'll go on up to where we're supposed to be, and we'll get organized up there, and then we'll come back and get you, or we'll get you up there somehow. We did. Just, he said, and you know, we got in there, and uh, just after we had our lunch, and went into this place where we were typing up these reports. And my God, it hadn't been two hours, probably. And they brought in the clothes of these two fellows uh, that they had been ambushed and killed. And then we, uh, each of us had to write a letter to their next of kin or somebody, I remember. And so that was a close one. And uh, we stayed. We never did go north. We stayed at that place right there. Where I guess we were so valuable in this typing. And every night we have to type up these reports, and then they'd send them down to Manila to MacArthur's headquarters, fly them down. And okay, uh, this went on for up through August, uh, and the, things were pretty well worked out there then. I think I've told you this story before, August 6th. Uh, I was put on a plane that night with, and told to just, well, I could only take a few pounds of stuff. And Oh, I want to tell you the snake story though. We lived in this, I got pictures of the little place we lived in, and we had a CIC on it or something where we were there, and uh, out back was a uh, place took shower, you heat up the water in a 55-gallon drum up on the stilt uh, there, and we had a thing rigged up, the engineer, I didn't rig it up, somebody rigged it up, and you could pull it and had a shower head on it, so you could get a nice shower, and you walked up on a duckboard in there. And uh, we took turns going out, and you had a, all you had for a light was a, a flashlight that was all blacked out except a peephole, just a little shade of light like that, because you had to kept, keep everything blacked out. And I went out to take my turn at the shower, and went out, and put, you put your light up above there, and uh, get yourself wet and soaped up, you know, and gee, this duck butter on me started moving, you know. I grabbed the light and looked down, and man, there was the biggest of one of these big snakes. Well, I don't need to tell you, I got out of there about as fast as you could move, and uh, didn't bother to even get the soap showered off. And I back in, and uh, some other guys went out to take a look, and they verified it, and that's what it was. So after that, you never, I never took any night showers, took them in the daytime. The snake wanted the water. It didn't attack me or anything like that, but it was close enough. Poisonous snakes. Oh, yeah. Deadly. Poisonous snakes. Big suckers. I remember in training, they kept telling me, these are, you know, watch out for these snakes. So, on August the 6th, the day they dropped, August the 6th, yes, the day they dropped the atomic bomb in Hiroshima. I left that night, and when I got in Manila in the morning, the uh, kids were out there with the newspapers about this atom bomb being dropped in Hiroshima. So we had to go to Quezon City, a place outside of Manila, where all the intelligence stuff was, where it's putting all this stuff together. The idea, we were going there, getting ready for the invasion of Japan in November. And uh, that's certainly what we expected to do. And uh, 
few days later, of course, they dropped the second bomb. And we actually started work and trying to make this all, put all this stuff together. And where the, you see, a lot of the interrogation was of the prisoners of war was to find out as much as you could when they'd been back home, how things were at home in different parts of Japan, how, what was going on, and how the morale of the people was, and all this sort of stuff, you know. Learn about where their uh, units were set up and where they would. So we knew just where we would be going and uh, yeah, where we were going to land in Japan. Well, you know the rest of the story. The uh, things ended up in a hurry there, and, and uh, I think even before they had signed the final uh, peace, uh, uh, the final uh, surrender papers there in Tokyo Bay, why. Uh, we, uh, I got a copy of the orders. You'll find them somewhere around here someday. It's, uh, t uh, ten people's names on there, including mine, all named Mr. Gordon Cumming, Mr. So-and-so. We'll proceed to, uh, I guess it says Nagasaki, Japan, by the fastest possible route. You had to find your own travel. Get there the best way you can. So we had to go around, beg and borrow, and find ways to get there. And we finally couldn't get a plane. Uh, I guess it was... Uh, they weren't landing any. Well, they weren't landing many planes in in Japan. We got up there and board ship and uh, got off in, just in Nagasaki. Just as uh, they were loading the uh, they were loading the uh, American Red Cross ships with the prisoners of war there and there and oh my God, what a mess that place was and. Uh, we all went in on the ready uh, to think, you know, they may you see all these people lined up on shore and you couldn't make out. Are they, you know, are they armed or are they military or who the hell are they? And we just found out once you got there that they were people just destitute for food and uh, all the stuff along the warehouse uh, had been radiated, you know, and uh, anything that was grain or food or stuff like that. So you immediately felt, uh, you know, you're of this feeling of hate and, uh, turned very fast to feelings of, my God, what, what have we done? And uh, we couldn't stay in Nagasaki. We had to get out. Went out two miles. They said there's a building the engineers examined. It was an old uh, missionary school, Methodist, that had this school out there made of brick. So we would go there and stay until we got further assigned. So we went out there and got in, and you know, you're tired. This is tiring business, and all this day and everything. And geez, everybody, when once they got a cot set up in this place, they flopped down, you know, to rest. And you see your clothes all on. Hadn't been there, I bet, minutes. And the engineers came through everybody out of this building. It's been further examined, and it's not safe. It's, it's been blasted, infected. So we got out, slept on the ground that night. And just the next day, uh, we got a sign, four of us got signed from Nagasaki to Kumamoto, go to Kumamoto. So we uh, went to Kumamoto, and there we set up our headquarters there and uh, worked with the um, military government. And, uh, well, we had these, uh, we had a page, I think it's on that orders, of the extreme nationalist organizations they had to be on guard against. They thought maybe somebody would try to start stuff up again. Well, fortunately, there was there were some incidents, but nothing too big you couldn't handle. And Chinese prisoners of war, we had they they had a bunch of Chinese prisoners of war, and they let them out, and then they went ransacking the country and uh, taking everything they could and stealing, and we had to get them rounded up and get stuff away from them. And sugar it was brown sugar, it was I remember, and uh, clothing, some uh, blankets and stuff like that. And we took those to a, an orphanage, happened to be a Catholic orphanage, orphanage, and stuff like that. We handled that kind of stuff. Did you carry a weapon? Oh, yeah, all the time. A bunch of weapons. You know, all kind of weapons. But uh, it settled down once you set up your network of informants around there. You had people coming to you now, knowing, and they'd tell you where they knew where a cache, you know, like this word we use on a computer cache of where weapons were uh, located. And we had to go into schools and see if the various pages had been torn out of MacArthur had ordered certain pages to be torn out of the books, the textbooks, and so on, of, uh, about the emperor, what a great guy he was, and so on. We had to do that kind of stuff. And every day, every week, we had to give a report on the economy, the educational system, and 
several other categories. And uh, so February came in '46, and uh, I was asked if I wanted to stay on, and we thought over some other day, you know, and uh, for what? So he came home on February '46 by Honolulu. Case of smallpox on the ship. We had to put in Honolulu again. And uh, fortunately, I think there was only one or a few cases. Came back to Seattle. Flew to Fort Dix, New Jersey. Discharged. Came back. In 1946. Back to Cornell. Are glad to see you back up again? No. Family? No. No? The war, the war ended for people in when Germany, when the European War ended. They knew very little about what was going on out in the, in the Pacific. And as far as people, and coming back in February of 46, I mean, uh, people didn't want to, well, they heard enough about the war. They'd been, they told us all the problems they had. They didn't have uh, sugar and they didn't have food, you know, or they couldn't get everything they wanted. And so, uh, and it was, uh, not that you expected any great uh, applause or anything, but it just it was a. You know, so just what happened? Soldiers like myself have been together. They kind of pull. They pull together. You know, for a while I did too, but I got tired of that around the veterans of foreign wars and the other outfit there. But your family must have been glad to see you. Oh, well, they were glad. Oh, of course they were glad. But they had their own beliefs. Sure, they were. But they were busy. Uh, with their own lives, and it hadn't been too easy either, you know. Uh, I know my, uh, I'll tell you, I uh, I always sent some money home, was going, but I, I had a sort of the half idea of the summer was being saved for me when I got it, got out. But I found out, and not that my mother wasn't a very, very liable honest woman, but things hadn't got that much better uh, for her and them. And uh, she used most of the used most of the money, and uh, that was a surprise to me. But I understood. And uh, no, you didn't have uh, much. I was too late to start Cornell. It was uh, too late in the semester to go back there. Now you had the GI Bill, you know. So boy, this is going to be this is a different experience now. So the last couple of years in Cornell were uh, rather pleasant, you know. All you had to do was study and didn't have to work. And, and you're older and you're a more serious student. And uh, so I got it, kind of liked it. And uh, But again, I graduated in uh, February because I ended up in the middle of the year semester. And that's when I uh, uh, got out of there. Then I went to California, a fellow I'd been in the service with from Harvard. He called up, just one of those things. and. Uh, I guess he'd heard me speak about my head relative in California. He said, I'm going to California and going to San Francisco. He had a father in law that was a, in the banking business. Who's his uh, name? was uh, uh, Randy. Oh, I can't remember. We met at, we met at Malden, Missouri. And in fact, I was supposed to go overseas with him to Europe. And that was the one where we got. Uh, separated down in somewhere in North Carolina. And they lost my records. So we, that never came off. Oh, God, I can almost speak out his last name, and it doesn't come here right in a moment. You wouldn't know. Uh, you know, anyhow, he uh, had an old Lincoln car he got somewhere, and we drove across the country, took our time. He had, he zapped me out there right away. And we had a nice, pleasant trip. And we'd stop and work a few days here for Somebody, we got to know somebody in a veterinarian, we spent some time with him. And another people from Detroit were setting up a store out in uh, Arizona, Scottsdale. And uh, we just happened to stop for gas at a gas station. And uh, we were trying to inquire what's going on around here. And, and said, you know, we're taking our time going across the country, anything to do or anything. He said, there's a woman, and people just moved in down the street here. She's setting up a clothing store 
And she's got all these boxes coming in from wherever, Detroit or somewhere, and she needs help. She said if anybody came by looking for a job, we went down, we spent a week there and had a great time uh, unpacking the stuff and helping her set up this store. So things like that, thanks for asking. And, uh, he went to San Francisco, I went with him to San Francisco, spent a little time in San Francisco, and then I came down, I hitchhiked from San Francisco to Los Angeles area, and I had the addresses of uh, some fellows I'd been the service with. So we'd stop and see them, redo old acquaintances, you know. And one fellow who was an interpreter, an uh, excellent interpreter in Japanese, he, he became quite uh, prominent in the uh, common cause movement and things like that. Jewish fellow, and he's in the, some kind of business there in Los Angeles. So I spent some time out there and uh, with my relatives again, and I hadn't seen my old uncle Will, who was along in his latter years, and uh, then came back in uh, in uh, '48 to Ithaca, and. Uh, so and you're. Is it just a vacation? Did you always plan? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I could have stayed out there. I had offers of work out there then, but again, my folks were getting along in years, and uh, they bought this little place down here in King Ferry, where Jane and I first lived, and where you were come to live. And uh, I knew his health was uh, failing, and uh, so I, being the youngest, and uh, I felt I, you know, probably should come back and. And I did to come back and work on that place and help get it fixed up a little bit. And, and then I heard uh, Cornell was looking for people to do interviewing in the study over in eastern New York, Richfield Springs area. And uh, I went over there and spent a month doing that sort of thing. And that's where I got to know Olaf Larson and Ed Moe. And one morning they went to the diner to eat, and one side on one side, and one on the other, and they looked over some of my interview stuff and said, uh, "Why wouldn't you like to come back to Cornell and take a master's degree?" And uh, and I said, "Well, I don't know about that." And the fact the matter is, I had a application in with the uh, with the uh, Department of Agriculture, is what they called a uh, market analyst, and. Uh, they told me I had been accepted, and I'd fill out all their papers, and, and they were waiting for assignment. So I said, well, I've got a job, you know, and I think I'll be coming along any time now. So we said, well, why don't you come down while you're waiting for it and kind of look things over, and school was starting and so on back there. And, and they said, really, we need you to help us analyze some of this information. This is a, a rural <laughs> sociology project? Big, or? big project. The Department of Commerce, point of the, it was when the interstate was just being built, it was in the process, and it was going to be the impact. What's going to be the impact on businesses on route, on route, long route twenty, to both the rural people, the farmers, the village people, and so on. So the Department of Commerce really was behind this thing, and uh, they're building the throughway. Then they're building throughway, the throughway. But route twenty, they wanted to know what was going to be the impact on on route twenty, and as you can see, it was disastrous for a while. Kind of put Route 20, took them off the map. They were kind of come back in later years. So I went there and uh, did that and uh, went down. And uh, the very day that uh, you kind of had to make up your mind what you're going to do, the uh, thing came in from Washington to go to Chicago as a market analyst. So I had to make a decision. And uh, I guess I kind of liked this idea of graduate work. So it was kind of interesting. And uh, why not try it for a year or so? So I did. You know the rest of the story. I stayed there and I got my master's and then I guess again they were kind of short of help or something and they uh, encouraged me to go on for the PhD. I had some extra hours and so on. Buried your mother in 1950. My father died in 51. Uh, now we've heard the story before about how you met Matt and the yeah. Yeah, yeah. Be a good one. Well, that's a good story. Yeah, yeah. It certainly was. People ask me about that. I probably use the expression jokingly, of course. You know, I was, I got stung. I was out washing an old car I had that Arlene had picked up for me at the uh, end of the war, and uh, I was washing it with just a sweat t-shirt on, and I got stung on the back. Didn't pay much attention to it, you know, and. Uh, all of a sudden, I began to swell up inside, you know, and I went and looked in the mirror, and my mother was there. 
that's at 329 West Seneca Street, so you can see he's in trouble. I said, you know, you better get. So, I don't know whether Arlene took me to the hospital or I just went up on my own. And there's where Jane came and gave me a shot of adrenaline. And uh, I went back home. I got in the thing started again. I had to go to the infirmary after that. But later on, I went and uh, that's where we met. So you were living, you were living at... Uh, 329 West Sunday Street. Yeah. We're all 49. And we was married in June of 1950. Is that thing running? Yep. And... We uh, found a little apartment. She was at working at the hospital, of course, and I was going Cornell, and uh, we found a little on Elm Street, a little downstairs apartment. We were there until you were on the way in 53, in April of 53. We wanted to get out of that apartment, and uh, we, uh, this place was available out here that my mother, Father own King Perry, so we decided to come out there for at least the summer, and uh, we got there as I say in April '53, and you were born in May, and uh, we it was made an inexpensive place for us to to be, just kind of taking care of the place and uh, be able to save a little money, and then in '58 uh, uh, we uh, built this place here and moved here that same winter. And been here ever since. Uh, but I've asked myself the question, as other people have asked, why did you, you know, come back to, to King Ferry? And I guess part of what's the circumstances I've just uh, uh, described is a place to be. But uh, there's been something in uh, all my life about the uh, interest in the, in the small community, in particular the rural communities, and the changes that have taken place in them over these years. And uh, I... Uh, I guess I really believe, part of my philosophy, that, uh, like uh, Thomas Jefferson, that uh, it's better to keep people living in small places and spread out, uh, kind of not potting them up in the cities. And I've lived long enough to see now the uh, flow is starting back to the uh, area beyond the cities and beyond the suburbs, that people are looking out. The last census they did here 1990, 1996 uh, shows that there's, uh, there's two million more people moving out of the cities and the suburbs beyond to the out to the other the rural towns, if you will, than are moving toward the cities. So uh, there is a, a definite uh, shift. It's been kind of on and off through the 70s and 80s, and so I've always had this interest in the, the concept of community and what makes a good community, what makes a community tick. I mean, you got this competition with people wanting great independence and individualism and so on. On the one hand, everybody wants to do it. But on the other hand, and certainly in crises and time, people are coming together in the sense of community. And uh, it's still very much part of my concern. And I'm going to start writing a... Uh, uh, piece about this place called King Ferry and what it's presently tried to describe what it's presently like and the, the, kind of the population and the various uh, services and lack of services that are are here and then I'm going back to the past of how it all started back in uh, 1794 and uh, bring it up to date and uh, then I'm going to try to it's some information, some thoughts from people about the future. What do they see as the future of this place another 10 years or so? So that kind of concludes my story, Tom. You know the rest of the story. It's Paul Harvey. Yeah. Well, like I said, so, it was just like a first installment. This yeah. would be like... <laughs> Encyclopedia, would, would nice Encyclopedia to, Britannica. Ah, well, it would be nice anybody to tell our whole story in an hour and a half or whatever. But I think it's good to get some of it on tape so it can... Put it in the vaults for uh, yeah. future generations. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Or we could have it transcribed if you want to use it for your memoirs. You can, uh, well, we could stick it. Maybe we we'll stick it in the uh, in there somewhere. You know, uh, it might do that. Because I started out with the memoir stuff, doing that, and then I thought, well, you know, this would provide me an opportunity to kind of get this out, and uh, appreciate it. 
Uh, I, I'd rather write something, try to be more objective and not make myself so much the uh, the, the subject. And uh, although during the time I've been here, I certainly will, you know, work that in. Some people say, oh, history is biography anyhow. Uh, okay. And, and uh, I think there's something to that. I'm going back up to the place where I was born and lived those first 17 years. I made contact with the people living there now. And uh, she's getting out the papers. I've never been quite sure of the different people who have lived on that place, but I can, I know from just, I just know that there's none of them ever made a decent living there. Uh, the people living there now works for UPS and he drives a truck from out of Batavia. I mean, there's a change, you know. And, uh, well, who lived there? How did your parents find their way there? Well, they were married, and their, my grandfather lived just south of us. He had a little eight acre farm there that he had bought and uh, after he became a naturalized citizen and so on, uh, my grandfather. And uh, that's where my father and aunt were born there, this was a late acre place. And they did custom they did custom work or he worked on the railroad and he worked around for farmers lost an arm in a fanning mill or something I heard. Uh, it's a clover mill I talked about it. And uh, and then when my father uh, they got married around nineteen five or so and uh, they had two children then. That little house they were in over there wasn't big enough. This was right next door it became available, this little farm. And they uh, moved over there, 35 acres, see? Did they tell you stories about their grandparents? No. Their parents? No, my mother, as I told you earlier, would, yes, yeah, she no. told me about her parents, um, but my father never spoke of his parents. I never met him, any of them. She died before I was born, and my grandfather, he had lived with uh, my mother and father in his latter years, and he uh, died in 1920, I think. I was just a year, I was less than a year old probably. And my older brother John, and he were very close for 10 years. I think he kind of helped mother take care of him. And what I've learned about their time in Ireland and coming over here and so on was stories repeated from him, not much, but he told the same story over and over and over again. And it's John who I talked to in later years where he died about what he was told. And apparently they were very close because he, uh, my brother John wouldn't even go to the funeral when the poor when his grandfather died. He was very feet. And I suppose one of the reasons was that they were just uh, physically close to each other, being in the same house and so on. And my father was away a lot buying cattle, and he never was much of a homebody anyhow. He was always traveling on the road. And uh, but. Uh, and on my mother's side, well, I've told you that, that uh, you know, he ended, his life ended and her life ended with respiratory problems. That's the reason her sister went to California, Rose, because she had respiratory problems of some kind. And uh, I tried to find out from uh, these people out there in California. In fact, I just wrote to them a little while ago. i never seen the picture. They got a picture somewhere of this uh, aunt out there. And um, I haven't quite figured out just what year she left. I know it was early 1900, before her mother, before her father died. I forgot to mention, and I probably told this before, because uh, I tend to repeat myself, uh, that he uh, was killed in 1905, the fall of 1905. There's a nice little obituary written up about him. He was thought of, thought of very well in the community, and he was, he was a skilled carpenter, I guess, and mason builder. and. Uh, he was just between King Ferry and Genoa. He was, uh, I know, constructing a barn there, working on a barn, and he took a fall from a beam, broke his neck, and died within you know, hours. Uh, sad part was that they were planning, that was his last job, they were going to California uh, that fall <clears throat> and uh, to be with the daughter out there and the rest of the family. And, and his own wife, she was suffering from respiratory. They thought. Better, better weather, better climate, better conditions for her health. So that was a reason. Uh, so that was always a disappointment uh, to my mother, and uh, I think that the, she never saw her sister again, and they never got out there. But all those stories, oh, you know, sad. There were people who were busy doing, surviving, and they never much spent much time on. Uh, discussing those things. Occasionally a letter would come or something and there'd be some um, 
sharing of that of what how things were and so on, but uh, very infrequently. We didn't write every week or every two weeks or and no telephoning back across the country, of course. And my uncle, he used to come every summer for a number of years during the late 20s, 30s. He loved to come and visit. He apparently was born over in Waterloo or somewhere. And how he met my aunt, I don't know. Uh, but he was a very uh, meticulous fellow about his parents and dress and everything, and a uh, very fine gentleman. And he loved to come back and uh, spend a few weeks in the summer. And always looking for a uh, real connoisseur of uh, cider. He loved, and there was plenty of it around here then, uh, before. And even after uh, prohibition uh, was a repeal, he'd uh, he'd want to order the so everybody had to look up a good, and he treated it very like a tonic, you know. He got siren, uh, he smacked his lips, oh, yeah, the taste of it he really enjoyed, you know. Uh, he just take him around to visit people over in Groton. He knew some people there. I took him over there. I just got a car. My first car, and it was a little used car. Took him to Waterloo. But, mm, well, I tried to get from his daughter some information. Said he never talked much about it. He was a, oh, she said he was an offer, I guess. I think they did tell me that. And so he didn't know much about his family. Mm -hmm. And this, who was this now? Will, his name is Sparks. Will Sparks. And he married. Rose Connell, my aunt. And they had two daughters before they left here in the early 1900s. It certainly was before 1905, before her father died, because I think the obituary says that he had a daughter living in the West or in California. But, and they all came back, or just he came back? He, he, well, no, the uh, daughter, one daughter came back, Mildred. She came back periodically. On visits, she and my mother were quite close. Um, she visited Smith, I remember, and uh, but this this is her sister's husband that came back, or this is yes, okay. But her sister didn't come back; just her sister's. No, her sister never made the trip back. As so I say, she only lived. This guy Hopping, we were talking about. Hopping was a guy, uh, her son, or one of the sons of one of these daughters. Uh, out in California, I visited last winter, last April. Uh, Herbert, Herbert Hopping. Uh, he was born, he tells me, in 1913. And uh, she had to, she died, I guess, shortly after that. He doesn't even remember much about her. Uh, he didn't know when she was born. Uh, I don't think he was too sure there she died. But, uh, I'm hoping he gets some more, but his health is bad. And his wife is bad. She's blind and lovely people. I feel awfully sorry for him. But, uh, Guess my battery's fault lines at least. There's of course a lot of detail, I suppose, but uh and out there the the uh quite an Irish settlement around the neighborhood where I lived in. And uh, I mean you just think of the names and some of them are still around, most of them are gone. On that road I lived on there between Route ninety and, and five corners distance of uh Four miles. There were fourteen. Uh, uh, I was talking to a woman who was a little older than I am. Lives up there, and uh, we were talking one day that when we were kids growing up, there were fourteen going farms on that road, and today there are three. I mean, three farmers that are farming all of that land plus more land. That tells you the change has taken place. And, uh, and farming. There's, uh, I can only count up about what you really call commercial farmers, people who really depend on their living. And what we call a King Ferry community, and what I mean by that is the the postal route goes uh, out of here, out of King Ferry Post Office, covers uh, 
seven miles, probably north and south, uh, four miles east, well, about 28 square miles. And uh, there's, uh, I don't know how many acres that represents, but uh, a few thousand, 15,000 maybe. Uh, there's only a half a dozen of, of uh, commercial farmers that work all, all the good land. Poor land, they keep, you can see the poor land, the lower yielding land, where it's tarred the lake with the rock outcropping, they keep pulling back. That's the reason Larson's is a golf course. The other day, it, it just gave out for farming. And you'll see, you'll see everything west of the lake road in the future is going gradually that way. And if uh, that'll all go into, uh, Lakeside properties, one kind or another, housing or something, and the place with a view of the lake, you know, it's already happening, but it's grad very gradual. And uh, the real competition among the, the the farmers for a piece of land, when it becomes available, good land, I mean, uh, to get access to it, you know. To, and the, the size of the fields, my goodness, they just... Uh, uh, amazes, amazes me how oh, all the hedgerows are gone. So, what we used to be several fields within that area that now, I maybe mean, tell you the story of Frank Turk Jr. here, who we had another farm up there. I didn't mention this in 1929. All the time, my father took out another farm, he uh, rented it or leased it, and we were into farming in a big way a lot of cattle and. Uh, Horses, uh, machinery, and everything, because he had John and I, two boys there to work, and Arlene, of course, she worked on the farm too, and my mother, everybody worked, and uh, my older brother, he, I know he put some money into buying some beef cattle stock like that. Man, you couldn't have picked a worse time to really expand farming because it just went bottom and right out of it, and uh, it was all downhill until '38. When they uh, really left the, had to leave the farm, my mother's diary. I've uh, transcribed that, and um, it's all diaries. There's quite a lot of repetition in there about the weather and so on every day. But uh, there are uh, some real insights you get from that diary of uh, of how things are going. Of course, I can kind of read between the lines because it uh, just reminds me, in addition to what she wrote of. Uh, what you know the situation was at that time, and uh, so it's uh, it's helpful. And, uh, that's in the it's in the word processor, I think, and some of it may be over in that other machine there, and I'll get that pulled out someday. And uh, why did it take so long for the land that's becoming uh, uh, more of a, a tourist? Mm -hmm. People build homes. Uh, seems like it wasn't a vacation spot or it wasn't a, uh, a spot for, you know, uh, people didn't build there be, or didn't, why did it take so long for that to become an area that people wanted to live in? Well, because it was farming, for instance, in the beginning and even back in Indian times, this was good land for farming and uh, the lake area was all fruit along the lake. The early settlers had a lot of fruit along the lake. Up in even in my time, I can remember big pear orchards down there and so on. And even when you play golf, down, you'll see old apple trees down there. You know, the number four you get down, there's an old apple tree there. Well, over the little. and uh, they uh, they like you know it was about good fruit region. Well, it becomes a matter of a comparative advantage of one part of the country to another part. The longer growing season and so on, the fruit moves somewhere else up north of Lake Ontario. That way, there you see out west and uh, so it's been a case of uh, it just uh, uh, going out of that kind of agriculture and of course now you see a little return of that with Pete salt stall with 21 acres of grapes down there you can grow but that was due to uh, you work you live look at that book of uh, I show you by Cleese about this Frank Constantine that came in and found out how you could grow the vinifera grape here in this region, and you, it, uh, it, was, it was okay for a certain kind of grapes. And of course, Experiment Station Geneva done a lot of research on this, and uh, you've got probably 60 wineries over 
ground in Seneca Lake in this lake now. And uh, only one on this side, though. Only one on this side. But uh, it has the advantage of being the only one because he advertises that way. In the Ithaca Airport, he's got a he's had it there for years. A layout of the only one on the east side of Cuga Lake, and they've done a great marketing job. And uh, but now he's got this housing development down here. You know, he's laid out on Atwater Road called Atwater Ridge for. Jesus, I don't know, I mean, a paved road all in there and everything, you know, and eight, 16, 18 boat slips down the lake, and uh, but it is moving. I mean, they're, they're expensive homes. You, see, you know, they're two, $300,000 places he's thinking of, but it hasn't taken off. And over in Bluffs, I uh, had 18 down there, and I think they've maybe got six over a period of several years now. It's only been built down there. So it's slow coming in. The economy is slow. Uh, and uh, but it's it's gradually, you know, pushing out this way. But in the meantime, people have picked up with uh, they bought this property real cheap along when the railroad went out in 1948. They uh, got a settlement where they, everybody that had wanted to buy some land down, they got it for twelve dollars a foot. And today, even today, man, there's lake, a lot of lake property for sale down there. Taxes have gone up. People get, get very few services or none down there, they claim. They don't. And uh, there was a meeting this fall. They were out in a storm uh, on this, you know. And uh, the town can't do anything for them because they're on private roads. And, the, you know, the town can't go in on private roads and pay, rebuild them and so on. And uh, they'd have to turn it over to the town, you know. They don't want to do that because you know, they want to keep them private. <laughs> and uh, so you, you know, so it's, uh, yeah. so they want their privacy. You can't blame them for that. But uh, it just, uh, regrettable, there's no uh, open uh, space here for people uh, in this town. It's the only town on this east side of the lake that doesn't have access. To the Lake. They just gave it up through disuse? Or? Well, they never owned it. The, the town really never owned it, and uh, the church owned it down there when the Atwater Company was there, and they were along the Presbyterian Church. And I'm not really sure of just what took place, and I am I'm kind of suspicious of why the town was not in there, and uh, would certainly would have legitimate first rights, I would think, uh, to be for the public benefit. Some part of it for uh, so the whole thing in private. So even when we went swimming down in King Ferry Station, it was belonged to somebody. Belonged to Presbyterian Church, I believe, and I think the reason they wanted to get rid of it is for that reason they didn't want the liability. And uh, I'm not sure whether it was ever offered to the town or why the town didn't step in and uh, get it, rather than regardless of the name, I'm, I'm in a private uh, individual uh, getting a hold of it and tying up the whole the whole front. Crazy, I, I get a lot of crazy ideas and I'm digressing now as I tend to do. But this ferry boat thing, I'm, another I get all kinds of thoughts. But one, we're having a meeting next week. And we got to answer this letter for these people down in Shelter Island about why they want the ferry boat up here this year. Wait, wait a year. They're willing to wait a year. But I don't know whether we can pull it off or not. But the thought has occurred to me say, look, if this is possible, they're going to bring it up on the the Hudson River and the canal system. They say it'll go through the box and all this. Bring it up uh, next, next year. It won't be ready. But bring it up. Get it on the lake here. Let people see, you know, this is it. This is a ferry boat. It's, it's up here. If you get off your butt and get these two landing sites, if you're on these two landing sites, this thing will be in operation in 99. So the way, you know, I think they see it, that they're, they're, it exists. Now the question is, how much is it going to cost to bring that boat up here? And uh, and then uh, where are you going to put it in the, in the winter of 88, 89? 98, I keep getting mixed up. 98, 99. But I think it's an idea worth uh, pursuing. Uh, we have to pay for the cost of getting it up here somehow. Uh, they've checked out, they say, the locks and everything, and the widths and the length of it and so on. And she, it will go through the locks, and uh, they say. I can show you that uh, last letter I had from them. Uh, to be continued. To be continued, Tom. Thanks.